Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and today we're talking about Jephthah. We're putting him on trial for heroism. We're not sure if we like him or not. Well, actually, we are sure. We, we have some conclusions that we've come to, but we want to share them with you. And maybe you can let us know what you think if we made a compelling case in his defense. Spoilers. Or uh, if we've miscarried justice. It's kind of a, a nice thing to know that we don't actually have to decide. We don't have to know. God knows, and he's the one who makes the actual decision. It's, this is one of the, the comforts of being a finite human being. You mean I don't have to judge everybody's Christian character? Nope. Oh, I thought Thankfully that was not. part of the job description. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, so who's this Jeff the guy? He was a Gileadite and a mighty man of valor and the son of a harlot. Okay. That's three things. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a heck of a resume. Mm -hmm. Gilead is what we today call Transjordan. He fights battles. Transjordan. And Meaning on the other side of the river where the tribes were like, this land looks good. This land looks good. This is a land for cattle and your servants have cattle. Yeah, that, that part. <laughs> okay. Um, and he was illegitimate. It says Gilead beget Jephthah, but the historical Gilead that we know about lived like a long time earlier. So either it's just kind of... Uh, you know, he was a son of Sacramento kind of thing, or maybe mm -hmm. it was some minor Gilead we don't know anything about. And this is the book of Judges, so chronology is a question. Yeah, well, chronology, the interesting thing is this is the one story where it's not a question, because mm -hmm. at the end, Jephthah will be an expert in chronology, unlike most theologians, because <laughs> he will tell us this is 300 years since the uh, conquest. Mm -hmm. So that puts it at the end of Judges. And... Um, not far off from um, Samuel's judgeship and all of that, and eventually the crowning of Saul. So this is at the end of things, and the and Israel is being harassed this time by the Ammonites. In chapter 10, God's people decided that maybe repentance from idolatry would be a good idea. And so they did. And God's answer was a little obscure. Uh, I delivered you from the Egyptians, the Ammonites, the Ammonites, all these people, but you keep forsaking me and serving other gods. So I'm not delivering you anymore. Go cry to the gods that you've chosen. See if they can deliver you. And Israel's response was, we have sinned. Do, do whatever you want, whatever seems good to you. Only deliver us. Okay, that's not quite whatever you want, but you know, they're desperate. And uh, they're beginning to get together and they realize that they... Yeah, they're going to take a stand against this tyranny. Good for them. They're not the warrior types, or at least, you know, they have their militia, but they really don't have anybody who's good at commanding troops. And so they look around and they find this guy named Jephthah who's been out on the frontier. He, as we said, he was um, the son of a harlot. And at some point, his family kicked him out and he went out on the fringes, out on the, um, oh, what's the sci-fi word? The periphery. The rim, and uh, has been hanging out there, probably on Ammonite land, doing the kind of thing that David's going to do later, harassing the bad guys, the enemies of his people. And he is followed by, what? what is the phrase? There were gathered vain men to him. Bunch of losers. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But he managed to whip them into effective fighting force. And so it's to him that the elders of Gilead go. And they say, we need your help. We, 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 we want you to be our leader. Uh, and he says, um, wait, <laughs> you kind of agreed and were in on the kicking me out and expelling me and chasing me out to the frontier and um, just get, I mean, I'm getting, and you want me to be your leader. Yeah. Yeah. We want you to be our leader. And, um, you know, if you, if you win then um, then you'll be in charge. You'll be our ruler. Won't that be... Uh, yeah, that'll be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's where we are. <laughs> and that's where Jephthah now comes into focus. What kind of man is this Jephthah? 
you, you look at the, the situation, and, and there was no doubt a time in church history where he's, he doesn't work for anybody. He's under no one's authority. He's out there with a bunch of vain guys. This guy doesn't sound good at all. On the other hand, if you're American, you, know, you mean he's a Lone Ranger. Yeah. He's Daniel Boone. <laughs> he's he's Steve McQueen, man. Yeah. I mean, he's he's Clint Eastwood. He's, you know, so <laughs> Americans may not have quite as much of a problem with with choosing this guy, but is he really going to be a good ruler? We're used to the guy who comes into town, blows away all the bad guys and, you know, vanishes. But will he be a good king, a judge, whatever? Well, Jephthah, having we confirmed that this is indeed what they're offering, the elders say, the Lord be witness between us if we do not according to thy words. First, this is chapter 11, verse 11 of Judges. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord of Mizpah. So what we're doing now is we're walking through this historical record and considering the good, the bad, and the questionable. Here, for instance, is a good thing. Not maybe a great thing, but a good thing. He knows he, he's going to take a political office, and he wants to do it before God, and he wants to make a solemn oath. So not the ways of a profane man or a pagan, but you could argue, well, anybody who grew up in Israel would probably know that's the way things are done. So that's just a starting point. Verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon and say, basically, why are you coming to my land to fight against me? And uh, the king of Ammon says, well, because Israel took away my land when they came out, came out of Egypt from Arnon to Jabbok, these are rivers, and unto Jordan. So now restore those lands again peaceably. Jephthah is um, going to try negotiation first. His immediate idea is not, hey, let's send a hit team and knock out their king. <laughs> he, he's, he's ready to talk. And it's not after regional hegemony. No, no, not particularly. And he does, he, he gets a response from the king who says, well, it's real simple. When you guys came out of Egypt, you took my land. So give it back and we'll call it a day. And Jephthah says, he sent messengers back, um, thus saith Jephthah. Israel took, and I'm, I'm going to read this because the details, not so much because the details are important, but the fact that he knows the details is important. Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness into the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, another southern nation on that side, Jordan, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner, he sent unto the king of Moab, these were cousins to the Ammonites, but he would not consent in Israel abode in Kadesh, which is on the... Um, on the banks of Jordan. And then they went along through the wilderness, encompassed the land of Edom, the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, a river, a brook that runs into um, Jordan, but came not within the border of Moab, for Ar Arnon was the border of Moab. So really clear, we didn't even cross into Moabite territory. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, not Ammonites, Amorites, the king of Hashman. And Israel said unto him, let us pass, I pray thee, through the, the land into my place. So we need to get to Jordan so we can cross. And, and, and cross at a convenient, the, the right place where we're supposed to cross. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the coast of Amorite from Arnon even to Jabbok, from the wilderness even unto Jordan. In other words, Ammonites, you didn't even own the land when we came out of <laughs> Egypt. It was all Amorite territory, and we were nice, and we were asking permission everywhere we went, and they provoked the battle. We weren't going to, to strike them at all because it wasn't on the agenda. God had not promised us anything on that side of the land, but they started it. God finished it. Um, and you yeah, were and even, he's very emphatic too that it's the Lord. It's that the it's, Lord who did this. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have a problem with this arrangement, take it up with God. <laughs> well, and and he and he pushes that further. And some people have been uh, not pleased with his answer, but that's because they don't understand sarcasm. Being good Christians <laughs> and all. 
So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Wilt thou not possess that which Kamosh thy God giveth thee to possess? <laughs> which is to say, not much. Nothing, really. So whomever the Lord our God shall drive out before us, them will we possess. <clears throat> Don't get into battle with our God, because we'll get your land. And now, are there anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? He was... You know, notice all the references are to Moab, who are cousins to the Ammonites, because Ammon apparently was not even a factor in the playing field at this point. Their cousins were the only people there. And the message here is, and your cousins didn't bother us. Well, there was that little thing of hiring Balaam to curse us. But, you know, in terms of military confrontation, they didn't even dare try that one. They left us alone. Art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and in Aurora and her towns, in all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon, 300 years. This was all 300 years ago. If this were an issue, 300 years is too late to go back and fix it. A lot of people have lived and died on this land since then. And, and, and there are some side issues here, I think, that this addresses that we, we need to go into. But, you know, there's always somebody, well, this land belonged to our ancestors. Yeah, 300 years ago. I'm sorry they lost it, but that's 300 years ago. It's a little late to try to fix things now. The Jubilee laws put it at more like um, 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, did he ever... And wherefore did you not recover them within that time? Did you know you didn't even make a claim? Wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be the judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Okay, some things that are important here. First of all, I would guess that the average Bible reading Christian in America today does not know this history. It's mostly in Deuteronomy in the first few chapters, sections that most Christians don't read. And if they do, they don't bother to remember it. Uh, Jephthah knew his Bible. Now you can, well, maybe he called someone a scribe or somebody who knew it. All right, at least he knew to call them. <laughs> I mean, hey. Yeah, you have to know that there's a, an answer for you reading in <laughs> history in order to look at the history books in this political question. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't it say some, the Bible say something like, hey, call that guy strong. Maybe he has, maybe he knows where it is. And, and, and <laughs> so he gets, he, he, he details the history as an argument. And his mind is that of a political historian. He knows military and politically what has happened, why lands got transferred, who owned what, who, when, who was in control of what, when. He has a little fine sense of sarcasm where it comes to um, competitive religion or comparative religion. He has no respect for Kamosh. No, he is not saying, well, you get what your God gets and we'll go. You know, this is not polytheism. This is your sarcasm and irony. Your God mm -hmm. obviously can't give you anything. Our God gives us whatever he wants. Get out of our way. And uh, as you say, he calls upon God to judge. He gives all the credit to God. He does not boast in Israel's superior firepower, uh, valor, strength, weapons, whatever. So, so far, he's coming across pretty good. Uh, as a godly man who actually knows the Bible, thinks historically, not mythically, Mm -hmm. Not philosophically, but in terms of the practicalities of covenant history, and is sure that God is in control of history, including military struggles. So that. But the king of Ammon won't listen. So, verse 29, and this is where things get more personal. The spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Is Mizpah and Gilead. From Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. One sentence. The next sentence. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord. So the beginning of the prior sentence is, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The next sentence is, and he vowed a vow. These are not, now, in terms of the history described here, some time took place. In terms of the textual description, one leads right to the other. Yeah, there it's is not no, in contrast in the writing. No, there's no contrast here. It's a continuation of the thought. God's spirit is upon him and moves him to go to places A, B, and C and take on enemy X, Y, and Z. And in that context, and Jephthah vows a vow. 
So what Jephthah is doing, he is doing in the power of God's Spirit and under the influence of God's Spirit. Now, do Christians screw up even when they're under the influence of God's Spirit? Yes, but there's a difference between missing the mark a little and veering a little to the right or left and turning around and driving back over the person behind you, which is kind of what he's accused of doing because of the nature of the vow. Here's what he vows. He vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, so the goal is what everyone's been talking about the whole time, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for burnt offering. Now, part of the problem here is that uh, there, there are a lot of assumptions we put into reading what was just said, including translation. Things. Yeah, the burnt offering is, uh, yeah, that stands out to me. I don't know if you were going to go there first. Oh, <laughs> well, 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 you bring it up, so let's go there. The word for burnt offering is a Hebrew word, Allah, that means ascension. It does not in and of itself require anything burnt or fire or anything or the destruction of the thing involved. It is true that in almost every time where we see it, uh, an ascension offering is a consumption of the whole thing. But there is at least one really, really, really important exception that's testified to both by Genesis and by the writer of Hebrews. And that's the offering up of Isaac. God told Abraham to offer up his only begotten son, to offer up Isaac as an ascension offering, over an offering. And Abraham sets out to do so. And from reading Genesis, we might get the idea that he stopped short because he was ready to plunge the knife into, into Isaac's chest. And God intervenes. But when we get to the book of Hebrews, we're told that uh, he who had the promises offered up his only begotten son. Yeah, there's so there's this ascension of the idea of going up. They went up the mountain. Usually when you burn something, the smoke goes up. Right. So it's it, two different ways of this upgoing, if you will. Yeah. Um, let me, in fact, let me read the what Hebrews 11 actually says, so I get it right. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Notice the past tense, past completed. He did it. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. It says it twice. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall they see be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So as far as the writer of Hebrews is concerned, uh, Isaac was a whole burnt offering, even though he walked away from it alive, because Abraham had Abraham had wholly committed him to God. And that's the heart of it. Now, once we get that, and we recognize the next book coming up for us is Samuel. Uh, and the first story is this woman named Hannah, who takes her son to the tabernacle and leaves him there. The King James says, lent unto the Lord given to the Lord for the rest of his life. And not too long into that story, we find that the, the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, are raping the women who assembled at the tabernacle. So there are women who had a permanent place at the tabernacle, helping somehow, they were priestesses, but they did something there, maybe prayers, maybe songs, maybe servant work, we don't know, whatever was necessary. And we run into this again, in Luke's gospel, yeah, in the Christ I thought you were going there. <laughs> in, the, in the Christmas story, where uh, Anna, which is, by the way, the same name as Hannah, is an old lady who's a prophetess who lives in the temple, does not depart out of it, but serves God with prayers and fastings day and night. So she is a, tab a temple servant too. So there, and that doesn't include all the Gibeonites who are permanently bound to the temple or the tabernacle and then the temple, although they should have been executed, but that was their way out. So we have plenty of precedent for something being given wholly to the Lord, uh, even called an ascension offering, and yet living. This is really important because otherwise it sounds like, well, first thought I think is, well, he just meant when the dog and the cat come out to meet him. No, you don't offer mm, God's yeah. dogs and cats to God. <laughs> They're Even unclean. if pets were a, a thing. And pets weren't, weren't and, and next, <laughs> pets weren't a thing. Yeah. Um, dogs and cats were unclean, and so they did not, and pigs, you should not live in Jewish homes. 
I suppose you might have a goat living in your house and in small uh, peasant houses. It was not impossible that animals might be there, clean animals. Um, so it's possible a sheep or a goat might live there. Uh, but more than likely to greet him, I mean, first of all, you know, back to dogs and cats. Sure, dogs come out to greet you. Cats do not. <laughs> cats don't care. They, they are annoyed that you are gone and annoyed that you are back. It doesn't matter. So, you know, all of that's going on. So, he, he could certainly not have been sure that a sheep or a goat, if that were the case, would come out. Come out to greet him would almost certainly be a human being, probably a servant. And he does not consider that maybe someone else might come out first. And the whatever is, is a whoever. He knows up front that he's going to be giving someone permanently to the service of God. In fact, in the last chapter of Leviticus, there, there's a difficult section. It has to do with estimating people for vows. And it's not terribly clear what's going on there. But my understanding is, well, here's the thing. We know that you could become a, a Levite or you could become, if you're a Levite, you could be adopted into the priestly family, Samuel was. There's a problem with that. That's a lucrative position. Mm -hmm. And it would be easy to say, oh, I want to serve God with all my heart. Can't wait for that tasty beef and lamb every day. <laughs> no, so <laughs> This is how simony was invented. <laughs> this is how simony was invented. And this is how God stopped simony. You want, to, you want to be adopted. Here are the prices you have to pay as an entry fee. And they were not slight. They're basically the prices of slaves. So you want into this family, you have to show it by coming up with a good deal of money up front. So lazy, scroungy people aren't going to be doing this. There has to be a serious desire to serve God and a certain upfront capital investment. So that being Is said, yeah. Credit to thinking of, you know, you're thinking of a person who comes out of the house to greet you. This is not someone who's already outside. So this is someone... Someone close to you. Fairly, say, yeah, fairly, if, if it's a servant, fairly high up the chain of command. Yeah. Not, places not a, in the house. Right. Not a so farm. So this is yeah. a high value person. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to have to pay this mm -hmm. for the servant. So he, he, he will have won a battle. He will have spoil. He will be able to afford this. And he's promising that he'll do this. He will, he will give this greatest of gifts, someone to serve the Lord in perpetuity from here on out. So th this in and of itself is not a problem. Of course, in our culture, we'd say, wait, you're vowing for somebody else. How do you? In Israel, it was a thing, okay? <laughs> we're individualists. We don't do that. But they thinking a little more covenantally and where servanthood was a reality that God legislated for that time, it was, it was okay. He had the authority to do this. Well, he makes the vow. Uh, it will surely be the Lord's or I'll offer it up for burnt, and I will offer it up for burnt offering. So Jephthah passes over. He fights. He wins. The children of Ammon are subdued before him. You see, the main thing is not the battle. It just gets a couple of quick verses. But Jephthah comes back to his house, and his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. This sounds a little familiar. You're about to give your only child as a burnt offering to God. Hmm. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Now, what happens here with some commentators is they say, you see, Jephthah was very superstitious. He did not understand that you cannot vow to murder somebody. And he thought he was trapped by his words. He basically believes in magic. And so he doesn't see that what he really should do is simply renounce his rash and, and, and ungodly vow and let his little girl live because that's what any human loving father would do. And well, that's assuming that it's <laughs> meaning to burn her alive. Like if yeah. you take that yeah. assumption out of the way, it's like, oh, you mean he doesn't want to lie to God? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. Different it's a matter here. of fact. Yeah. It's, your assumption, the assumptions you bring matter here. And she says, and apparently she is a very bright young lady and, and understands immediately what's going on. My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. 
For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. So she's she's totally on board and seems to understand what what's happening. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountain and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. She's not now, bewailing her life? Yeah, she's not bewailing her life. That it was so short that she never found true love, that she never had a husband. <laughs> it's very simply, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna be a mom. That's not about a short life. It's about I'm not going to have children. And um he says, Go. And she he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which she had bowed, and she knew no man. The I second think we're being just, a consequence of the first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we were just told exactly what he did to her. He consigned her to perpetual virginity, probably at the tabernacle. But more than that, there, there's something I think here that's more crucial than that. He did with her according to his vow. That's the inspired writer's voiceover. The inspired writer, Samuel or whoever this may have been, is saying what he vowed is what he did. What he vowed, the, the words of the vow are, to give this person to God as an ascension offering. He did that. Not commit child sacrifice, not <laughs> commit bloody murder, not break all of God's laws at once. It was worship God with a sacrifice. And the writer says, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you get it much plainer. If he had said the vow differently, then you might have some wiggle room. But given that this, that exactly what he said, and the writer says, and that's what he did, then he must have given her to God, and God must have accepted it, because otherwise he didn't give her to God. He threw her out into the, into the void, and God said, whoops, what's that all about? <laughs> and she knew no man. And it was and there's a, there's a footnote. It was a custom in Israel. But the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. The marginal note says to talk with. The word itself, from what I can tell from Strong's and such, the word rendered lament means praise or celebrate. Not Jephthah, but Jephthah's daughter. She becomes the great hero because in a few years, Jephthah dies. But she goes on, as a, since she's a young woman, she goes on for years ministering to these young women who come to her to talk to her about what it means to give your all for the kingdom of God and for the preservation of the promise of Messiah. Here is a great, people give Jephthah a hard time, but in the process, they completely ignore this young lady who is one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament. Because she wasn't asked, she wasn't consulted, her free will uh, choice was not involved here. She did what someone else vowed for her, and God honored her very greatly for it. Mm -hmm. You um, can contrast Saul and David when Saul forbade people to eat yes. until the battle was over, mm -hmm. and Jonathan didn't know about it, and he ate the wild honey. And when there's the reckoning for that disconnect, he was like, First of all, what were you thinking? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, why on earth would you vow to keep your army on an empty stomach? Yeah, That's this kind of dumb. for dad. This was a dumb idea. Yeah. And but then J Jonathan is willing to submit. I mean, not mm -hmm. with a great deal of enthusiasm because he thinks it was a dumb vow in the first place. Is now I must die. Yeah. Yes, son, you're going to die because Saul was jealous of him at that point. But the people have to intervene and say no to their king. What a concept. Um, and rescue him. Now, the rest of the story, well, we won't, I think, spend time with it now, but the rest of the story, um, they're trying. To, Ephraim gets out, gets its nose all out of shape again. Um, <laughs> you went over and talked and attacked the Ammonites and you didn't call us, so we must burn your house with fire now. <laughs> says, what? what? No, no. And he's not nice like Gideon. Because he realizes, he realizes these guys are so out of line. I did call you. You didn't help. And um, none of this, oh, the little bit you did is as good as what I did. Uh-uh. You're out of line. And so 
Um, looks like I get to kill you now. And so Jephthah and his guys attacked Ephraim and just slaughtered them and then took the fords of Jordan so they couldn't get back to their own territory. And I mention this only because of one word. As the Ephraimites came back and they saw the guards at the river, they knew they had to <laughs> pretend to be not Ephraimites. But there was one little problem. These people, this tribe that wanted to be the leader tribe, wanted to be the head of everybody, they were so insulated and isolated that they picked up a characteristic lisp. They couldn't pronounce the SH sound. And so the guards at the river said, Oh, you're from Ephraim? No, 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 not at all. We're from, um, you know, around here. Uh huh. Say Shibboleth. <laughs> Shibboleth. Uh huh. <laughs> Bob, take him out and kill him. What? No, I didn't. And thus the English word Shibboleth, meaning a secret password that gets you places. <laughs> but the story ends with Jephthah only judging Israel for six years. And he dies, and he's buried in one of the cities of Gilead. That said, we need to say something about why Jephthah was so upset about having to give his daughter to the Lord. I mean, isn't that a great honor? Even of Abraham, we're not told that, that he went into a panic. He trusted that God knew what he was doing and that God would keep his promises. But one of the ongoing things of the book of, of Judges is this desire for a human dynasty. And the prevailing theme, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The point is not that there wasn't a human king, but that they were not reckoning God as their king. And so there's this constant push for a human king to take the place of God. We saw it with Gideon. We'll see it again in the days of Saul, with again, which followed the first Samuel follows right on top of this. Because we remember right now we're at the end, 300 years after the Exodus. So we're right at the end of the period of the judges. Samuel's beginning his judgeship about this time. And Israel has not learned its lesson. They still want a human king. It's notable, too, that the intuition is that kingship is an inherited thing. Yeah. Hmm. It's not you something mean, that comes to the American mind naturally. No, it doesn't. But it is interesting that we should think the son of the king, the king's son, has some natural place. There's something um, a little um, divine imagery in that. Mm -hmm. Mm. The the closing thing, closing comment that people just plain ignore sometimes. Again, back to the writer of Hebrews, chapter eleven, talking of the great heroes of faith. He says, verse thirty-two: "What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah." And of David also, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the sword, escaped the edge, escaped the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant fight, turned to flight the armies of aliens, and so on. It doesn't say these people were perfect people. It doesn't say they didn't uh, go astray here and there. We saw that Gideon really did some weird things toward the end of his life. David did some weird, horrible Ooh. things in the middle of his life. And yet, and yet God used them, which should be great comfort to us that we don't have to be perfect for God to use mm. us. Uh, the question is not how good are you? The question is how good is God? What is God going to do with you in spite of the fact you're not all that great? And that's a very different question. There, uh, there used to be a saying in some evangelical circles, mostly I think holiness circles, and said, God cannot work through an unclean vessel. Is there that, another kind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Aside from Jesus himself, that's pretty much what we have on this earth. Um, Jesus was the only clean vessel who ever walked the planet as a human being. We are all unclean things. And as God used these judges, who with all of their fallibilities, all their sins, and some of the sins were pretty big, yet God used them. And then God recorded that he was well pleased with them. Uh, and that's something to remember. This is the this is one of the practicalities of the doctrine of justification by faith. When God says we're righteous before him, he actually means it. He doesn't mean, well, look, we're calling you righteous, but don't push it, bud. He really means that our works are acceptable and the things that are flat out sin, he forgives and passes over and sees us in the righteousness of his son. 
And that's a reason, that's a call for great joy. And, and reading through these uh, these Old Testament stories together should be really encouraging. Not wow, can anybody get anything right around here? <laughs> But we sometimes feel that looking at our own lives. I mean, yeah, maybe and, I should and, speak for myself. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I also, that reminds me, Greg, what you were saying about, um, uh, it's a quote, I, I want to say it's from Sinclair Ferguson, who mm -hmm. I absolutely also respect yeah. as a biblical teacher. Uh, and he says, no amount of your sanctification actually adds to your justification. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which also means that no amount of our screwing up our sanctification detracts from our justification. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that is such a precious and marvelous thing. And a lot of people really don't get that. They don't yeah. understand the full extent of justification. Not only does God accept us at the moment, but the righteousness of Christ, the sprinkling of his blood covers not only our lives, but all of our actions, either to wipe them out or to tweak them so that even the imperfections uh, God does not see. He accepts them as righteous things if they're done in faith for his glory. Even when the if, even when the motives are not completely pure and the faith is weak, he, he takes us as meaning better than we meant, as Lewis would say. <laughs> and uh, it's a great reason to rejoice. You don't have to spend your whole life looking and saying, well, well, I really screwed that up and my motives were rotten there and I completely failed on that one. And look, what I should have said there, and I didn't, and look what happened. It's easy to go through life that way. And one day God will reckon with us with complete, complete accuracy and purity. In the meantime, as Paul says, I, yeah, I judge not my own self. We leave that to God. And in the meantime, rejoice that he loves us as we are, and yet he wants us to be better. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change his love. Yeah, I mean, we look at the the heroes of the faith, the the Old Testament heroes and and legends, so to speak. Uh, not <laughs> legends not that they are real, reverend, but that they are yeah. legendary <laughs> in their quality. Yes, yeah. like get, a, get ahead legendary. of the synonym. Get ahead of the synonyms there, and we we look at them, and you know, if you don't actually read their their passages, there is the even in Christian circles, just like the kind of general cultural knowledge, oh, these guys were like God's favorite. They yeah. they did everything right, and he loved them for it. Yeah. And actually reading their lives and seeing their mistakes and seeing the sins that they committed, even while they professed Jehovah as Lord, it is incredibly comforting to be like, wow, David did all that nonsense. <laughs> And you know, God still said he was a man after my own heart. I, okay, I feel a little bit better now that I, you know, <laughs> forgot to give back this person's pen that I used to sign a check at the bank. Or, you know, you don't feel all these little things that you you, you want. We all, we all are, I think, to some extent, inherent perfectionists that can never get it right. And because yeah, we're all selfish. Exactly. It all weighs down on our shoulders and we're like, I can't do anything right. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, that's correct. But it doesn't yeah. mean you're lost. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Now, moving on. Yeah, Talk you're totally it. depraved. That doesn't make you garbage. Yeah. Let's, exactly. Let's yes. The grace of God. And, and, and just to take a, bring the Gnostic bell and take another turn. Oh, hold on. That's Try that bell. again. <laughs> like a Gnostic camera. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, the, there it one is. of the dangers of Sunday school and certain types of Sunday school teachers are they only tell the nice, sweet parts of the story mm -hmm. and leave out lots. And I don't know how much Jephthah makes the top 10 Sunday school stories anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I heard it as a kid, but I probably heard it as, yeah, he offered her on the altar, sort of like um, Agamemnon offering up uh, Pachinia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but that there would have been much more than that. Maybe, oh, how horrible was he? But we don't, we're not. Teacher, what does adultery mean? <laughs> I got that very question today. Well, Did you no. indeed? Well, context. it wasn't adultery. It was lust. I was teaching on the uh, ah. Matthew chapter 5. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I once got that in high school. This was years and years ago by their school. And it was from the son of an elder in his church. Oh, no. And he did Yeah, see, not... my fifth graders have an excuse. They're still young. <laughs> yeah, he was well past puberty. 
And he was serious. He wanted to know. And I told him in very blatant terms. And he was a humble young man, a godly young man. He said, whoa, I've got a lot of repenting to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Oh. But, well, yeah, well, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He's still, he's still walking with the Lord faithfully. He's got a great it's, life. It's um, part of the work of the law. You know, Paul talks about the law teaches me what my sin is. If we're not giving that to our kids, we're robbing them of the comfort of Christ because they don't yeah. know how far they fall. They don't know yes. where the sin is in their lives and how and that, Christ redeems them. And that reminds me a bit of what we talked about. It might have been last week. Um, the days have all blurred together for me. But it reminds me of what we talked about, which is you know there, there's not really a part of Scripture that is – not meant for everyone right. to yeah. to hear because it's it's God's word to His people. That means His people of all ages. Uh, we mentioned, or I think I brought up, how uh, Song of Solomon was something that right. the Jewish children weren't allowed to read until they had reached the the age of. Um, I forgot the term for it. All of a sudden, you know, they, they, they turned thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I knew that term. There's another word for it that's in English. For bar no, it's an English word. I can't remember. But um, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. Major, majority. Majority. Maybe, I, maybe I'm thinking one. of age of majority. This is off topic. <laughs> Basically, um, yes, it's like you can't do that with scripture. If if we if you're going to actually teach law and gospel together, you have to actually tell them what the law says and what it means and what it means and. It always has to be counterpoint. It will be counterpointed in in solid teaching with gospel, where it's like, look, this is this is something you're supposed to do, but if you're justified, you can't lose that. Like right. th th these are, you have to have the balance, and it's always I've always found it really sort of difficult to put that into words, even though I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you did a good job. We we pre preach the holiness of God. Which is to say the love of God, because his holiness and his love are the same thing. This is what mm -hmm. it means to be holy is to love perfectly. And we don't. So in preaching that, we, we show ourselves sinners. And so, and so now we see the redemptive love of God in Christ, and we, we preach justification by faith and blood atonement. And then mm -hmm. on the other side of that, and along with that, we can then say, and now, how would you like to be more like Jesus? And we actually, from our hearts, say, oh, that would be wonderful. Well, you got a long road, but let's get started. <laughs> and that's also something I love too about the reform tradition is that the the, the major reform confessions um, they they begin with who God actually is, yeah. and then they move on and talk about how we fall short of that standard. <laughs> yeah. But there is a I think a danger in starting with just like for. This is specifically an issue for uh, the vaguely reformed, new reformed uh, kind of people uh, <laughs> of the last 20 years or so. But starting with just tulip, mm -hmm. it starts with us and starts with total depravity. Yeah. It's giving... Yeah, I don't, it, know it, how, it, I don't know that it's that recent. I think it's been a problem for a long time. That's uh, true. No, it's it's been around longer than that, but... It may become if, it may if you can if you can problem, yeah it's like condensing that condensing doctrine just starting with soteriology and starting with us and starting with our problem instead of starting with the beauty of God yeah it does you you have the wrong focus basically you have the wrong focus and 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 some would would suggest I don't know with how much truth that this is the difference between Luther and Calvin Luther got hung up on justification by faith. Calvin backed away and said, no, glory of God, which will lead us to justification by faith. I'm sure Luther would have given full credit to the glory of God, but emphasis can matter. Mm -hmm. And if, it's, if you're just talking one person, it may not matter, but when that one person begins to affect an entire tradition or a seminary or a school or a denomination, then those kind of things begin to take on form and consequence. They get so, amplified over time and over multiple yeah. lives. 
Yeah. I mean, the the negative form of that. I've always thought of that phrase from 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 our Lord, who when he when he's talking to the Pharisees and basically says, "You you go miles and miles to make a convert, and then you just make them ten times the son of hell that you are." Yeah, it's like. The negative aspect of that would be with false teaching, where it's like, yeah, the the first guy who taught this this sort of error might have been like he might have squeaked by, as far as his his doctrinal accuracy, he was just like a little bit off. But those things then get emphasized yeah, by the next generation that he taught, yep. and then they just go off into these weird branches. And that is obviously something that happens even with good things yeah. getting the wrong emphasis mm-hmm. or strength of emphasis. Um, we we always have to go back to what scripture and what uh, the the voices from church history have always emphasized, yeah. and that is you know the the wondrous what's that phrase from Bob Inc. It just it's a book that recently got translated. It's like the wonderful works of God, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Less one good custom should corrupt the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in 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 passing, I mean, we can close with this. Um, I got a uh, an email from a, a former student. I don't remember if he would know him, and I won't use his name without his permission. But he he wrote and just said, um, "Hi, how you doing? Uh, really appreciated your classes, the emphasis on covenant and all that." And he's not from a reformed church. And uh, just had w- interested in my health and my family and how the school's doing and all of that. And he set out to ask. So I, I'm involved in team ministry now. So here's some basic questions. He asked four questions. Were really good questions. And the first one was, how do you give encouragement to young people? Um, and my answer was, it was more than that. But the first line was, teach them to know God. Because mm-hmm. if you don't do that, if they don't know God personally, theologically, personally, experientially, in obedience, all the other stuff is going to be fluff and flack. So, yeah, the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, shall we wrap up with some recommendations? Sure. Um, I'm going to recommend having friends over, specifically while you clean your house. <laughs> Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a friend say to me, Emily, I'm, I'm coming over to your house tomorrow and I'm not leaving until you've cleaned it. <laughs> and, you know, she's, she's not saying this because I'm a slob, although I feel like I am. Um, she's saying this because I'm a pregnant lady who hasn't gotten on top of life and is starting a new job and has just moved into a new place and, it's been a lot. And she knew that what I needed was someone to sit with me and keep me on task. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what I needed. She did this a, a few weeks ago and we it was a transformation. It was life-changing for sure. <laughs> and then she actually came over again this past weekend and helped us this was this was a more active. This is, wasn't her just sitting with me. This was her actually taking charge of this room that actually you guys can see it right now. It's all clean. It didn't used to be this clean. I don't know if you remember, but we have like our little nursery set up now. So Aww, it's lovely. all nice now and it's clean. And I have a floor that was previously <laughs> covered in cardboard boxes. And now, cause it was the junk room. It was the, mm. this is the place where all the things are going to go until we figure out where they actually go. So mm. Yeah. Have have people over who are willing to be over at your house when it's dirty, <laughs> whether they're just going to sit with you or actually take your take your life in hand and help you out. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, both I'm of those gonna, were tremendous blessings. I'm going to jump on that, and I'm going to recommend having people over to your house and your house is not spotless. <laughs> because how? Yeah, because yeah, often our houses aren't. Because you know what? Real people live in them. them. (laughs) They live here. And our friends don't particularly want to... I mean, yes, we want to make it nice for people, and that's an act of courtesy. I understand Mm -hmm. that. There's a point. There's a place. Mm. But our friends want to see us, not our house. And yes, oftentimes they will jump in and help us clean because it gives us something good to do together. And working together and facing a problem together is one way that God helps to sanctify us. People to do things with 
and to, to set examples and to encourage us and to give us advice. And then things where we do that together. This is a good part of, of sanctification. Even if it's just visiting or talking about the things of scripture or the good book we've read or singing songs together. These are good things. So please don't wait until your house is perfect. <laughs> Be okay to have the homey house where people feel welcome. That's yeah. right. I've heard that summarized as the difference between hospitality and entertaining. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> we um we covered that a little bit uh during Sunday school at Reformation Fellowship one time last year, maybe the year before. And it was like I think they they used the word uh hosting, hospitality mm-hmm. versus hosting, because they want like like all good um, you know, OPC pastors they had to have alliteration and, um, <laughs> i was thinking that as a baptist thing <laughs> i've only really noticed it in the opc churches that um i've been to uh, all the baptist ones they typically don't at least at least That's the ones funny. i've been to um on on that point though i, I did want to also add so uh when my wife who is also named emily uh, and I were still engaged, I would work from her living room and in lulls during work, while she was there anyway, we would find things to clean. <laughs> and it was top-notch, like, engaged people activity. Because <laughs> it was like, ah, this place is filthy. And look, the two of us worked together and it's now clean. We can accomplish anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I think I said I had two things, but I forgot the second thing. Um, so my recommendation is very different. Uh, it is a actually a television show I would like to recommend uh, called Lock and Key. It's a Netflix original, mm-hmm. and it is surprisingly good. It's based on a graphic novel, and essentially the the plot is um, a family moves back to their their dad's family home in Massachusetts and being Massachusetts, it is creepy and there are magical things happening uh, because as we all know, New England is just like that. Yeah, because um, Puritans used to live there and they had witches. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> but it, it is it is very interesting because uh, essentially the, the MacGuffins, so to speak, mm. are uh, are magical keys that the the kids start to find because the keys whisper to them from their locations in the house <laughs> and they each have something they can do. And so there's, there's the anywhere key and you put it into a door, you think of a door you have seen in person or uh, in a picture and you turn the lock and you open the door and you can walk to that place where that door is located. Mm. So it's, it's kind of, there's other ones too that I won't go into all the detail, but what it's, is what's interesting uh, uh. and why I like, we, why I ended up liking it so much is that, the antagonists who show up, there's only one at first, but uh, they are demons and they are referred to as demons in the show. And they are surprisingly accurate to how Christians think of demons as obviously malevolent entities. And the way that they actually seduce, for lack of a better term, in the show is how Satan works as well. Which I found very in- intriguing to come from uh, secular writers, but it, most of the the temptations were like, "Well, I can help you. I can help you get the the the, the life that you want, and uh, to not have fear anymore. And you know, all you have to do is just uh, just one little thing. You know, just do whatever I want. And, you know, bow down and worship me. Basically, <laughs> it is the pitch. And um, anyway. I, I could I could rant because we actually finished season two yesterday evening, and they so beautifully brought like seven or eight different plot threads from both seasons to a satisfying conclusion. Ooh. Within about fifteen minutes, I cried. There were <laughs> very good moments. So, you know, it's a Netflix show. There's stuff that is not consistent with the uh, the Christian worldview, uh, but. On the whole, I found it very, very satisfying and very interesting and very well written as well. Although a lot of the characters are, are very stupid. <laughs> that's okay. Well, a lot of people are really stupid. <laughs> Honestly, that's probably the most realistic part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my recommendation. Uh, Lock and Key, L-O-C-K-E. 
and key because they are the lock family. Oh, of course. Oh, uh, okay. That's so funny. I had a fifth grader today. We were talking about the fool says in his heart, there is no God. This was in reading class at, you know, yeah. hours and hours after I taught Bible class. And I was playing a little bit of devil's advocates with the, with the kids. And, and one of them said, but like, everybody's a fool. And I was like, all right, what makes you say that? And he's like, you literally said that this morning. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. That one came back to bite me. Anyway, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a treat. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please do. We have an email address. It is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We're on YouTube, Rumble. I think we're still on Facebook. If you'd like to support us financially, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. Huge thank you to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you. And we hope to see you next week. Take care.